And we'll start with a live look here at Parliament Hill, where we're awaiting U.S. President Joe Biden's address to Parliament. It's a packed house with members from all sides and special guests in attendance. Several former prime ministers are also in attendance, including Jean Chrétien. The two Michaels, Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig, who were detained in China for 1,000 days, received rather a standing ovation a short time ago. And we'll listen in live now. Just like that. Just like that. <laughs> you told us that before. So we are, of course, still waiting for President Joe Biden to enter Parliament. Should be any minute now. Uh, a little behind schedule, but we'll see uh, President, U.S. President Joe Biden and First Lady Jill Biden enter first, followed by the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. And of course, this is a big visit. This is the first bilateral visit by U.S. President to Ottawa in the last 14 years. This is much anticipated, delayed by the COVID-19 pandemic. And as I mentioned just a few moments ago, we could see uh, Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig dubbed the two Michaels in the crowd. They've been invited to attend this speech in Parliament as well as the Trudeau dinner afterwards. Uh, so quite a big day here as we continue to wait for U.S. President Joe Biden to appear to address Parliament. And of course, this is his first visit to Canada as U.S. President. And so it is much anticipated as we wait here. Seems as though we've got some more people coming out. We'll listen in live again. Do I sit? <laughs> yes, and then we'll, we'll stand here. As soon as they enter, stand up. <laughs> there he is. Mr. President, Dr. Biden, welcome to Canada in the House of Commons. <laughs> Monsieur le Premier ministre, Monsieur le Président Fury, Speaker Fury, Mesdames et Messieurs, les ladies and gentlemen, party leaders, members of parliament, your Excellencies, guests, allow me to welcome you to this very special event. On behalf of my colleagues, we are honoured by your visit. As we come together under one roof, we take a moment to celebrate the friendship and the shared values of our countries. We celebrate our people and the history of cooperation between Canada and the United States. A prime example of this cooperation can be seen in my hometown, North Bay in the riding of Nipissing Timiskaming, where Canadian and American military personnel work side by side at NORAD to ensure our safety 
by patrolling the skies of North America. NORAD is proof that when Canadians and Americans venture to undertake a mission together, we accomplish great things, but more importantly, our great friendship grows. The, this visit reminds us all that we must never take our friendship, this cooperation, these shared values for granted. I would now like to invite the Right Honourable Prime Minister to say a few words. Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, we welcome to our Parliament the 46th President of the United States of America, President Joseph R. Biden, Jr. Mr. President, you are a true friend to Canada, and that matters more than ever in this consequential moment. Make no mistake, these are serious times. When the consequences of a warming planet are intersecting with the aftermath of a global pandemic, when an unjustifiable war in Europe has shocked the conscience of the world and exposed the vulnerability of energy markets and supply chains, when families are facing the pressures of inflation and struggling with affordability, when citizens around the world feel anxious about their future and their kids' futures, Mr. President, as it should be, our two nations stand united in this moment, finding solutions side by side. On va continue. We will continue to work together to create jobs and to build economies and societies that are healthier and more sustainable. The economy, the environment, and security are interwoven. And that has never been more clear. It has never been more clear that everything is interwoven. Economic policy is climate policy, is security policy. People need us to think strategically and act with urgency. And that is exactly what brings us together today. Mr. President, throughout our history, Canada and the United States, as friends and allies, have faced many challenges together. Pandemics, recessions, wars. Here in this House in September 1939, members of Parliament debated going to war. A few years later, Canadian and American soldiers were fighting against fascism shoulder to shoulder. There are battlefields around the world where our soldiers lie in cemeteries, shoulder to shoulder. War has now returned to Europe. As you well know, Mr. President, Canada will continue to stand strong with Ukraine with whatever it takes. Together, both of us are partners that Ukraine and the world can count on. Since Putin launched his brutal invasion, like you, Canada has provided significant military support, in our case, artillery, ammunition, armour and tanks. From 2015 to today, with Operation Unifier, the Canadian Armed Forces train the brave members of the Ukrainian military about 35,000 of them and counting. With partners and allies, we've both used sanctions and punitive economic measures to continue to deplete the Kremlin's war chest. And after a terrifying spring, a violent summer and fall, and an exhausting winter, Ukraine still stands. One year ago, 
our friend President Zelensky, addressed this chamber to thank us for having supported him from the beginning. Today, Mr. President, together, we reiterate that message for President Zelensky and all Ukrainians. We remain at your side. It is by defending democracy and the rules-based international order that we will ensure the safety and security of Canadians and Americans. Vladimir Putin has underestimated the, the resolve of Europe and NATO allies. He has underestimated the strength and the courage of Ukrainians and their will to defend their language, their culture, and their homeland. Mr. President, today I want to introduce you to Natalia, who I met just last week. Natalia arrived in Canada from Ukraine more than 10 years ago. Give us a wave, Natalia. Yes, thank you. She arrived in Canada from Ukraine more than 10 years ago. She's safe here with her family, but she still has a lot of loved ones in Ukraine. Every time she hangs up after speaking with a cousin or a friend, she feels a twinge in her heart, wondering if this conversation might be their last. Mr. President, we cannot and will not let Natalia's loved ones down. The Ukrainian people are counting on us. We must stand shoulder to shoulder with Ukraine with as much as it takes, as long as it takes. But I bring up Natalia now, not just because of what's happening over in Ukraine as we speak, but also because she's key to what we're building here today and tomorrow. You know, I met Natalia in Nova Scotia last week. She currently lives near Bridgewater, which is a small town of some 9,000 people. For over 50 years, the Michelin Tire Plant in Bridgewater has been one of the most high-performing facilities in the world. It is thanks to the strength of uh, the workers there that Michelin has just announced major investments to modernize its facilities in order to respond to the growing demand for electric vehicles. Good, stable jobs like the ones at that plant truly count for Natalia and her family, and they also count for our large and small communities. Scotia meeting with Natalia and others. I met third-generation tire workers at that Michelin plant. And because of the work that we're doing together and investments we're making for the future, that community will have jobs for generations more to come. And that doesn't just impact them in Bridgewater. It means there will continue to be vans delivering food to grocery stores in California and trucks delivering medical supplies to hospitals in Pennsylvania that roll on tires made in Nova Scotia, as it should be. <laughs> Mr. President, in 1987, Ronald Reagan addressed this House in a final big push towards the first Canada-U.S. free trade agreement. He pointed out that the U.S.-Canadian border was a meeting place rather than a dividing line. More than 30 years later, our border is no longer just the place where we meet each other. It's the place where we will meet the moment. It's a place where we will meet the future. A future not only with good jobs, but good, stable careers for generations to come. See, we're also joined today by steel workers from DeFasco in Hamilton. One of them is Neil. Why don't you stand up, Neil? <laughs> you 
You see, Neil's mother worked at DeFasco in the 70s. His father worked in the finishing steel area for 37 years. Now, with the investments we've made to help DeFasco phase out coal-fired steelmaking in favour of electric arc, Neil's kids and grandkids and great-grandkids will be able to choose careers making the clean steel the world needs to build EVs, buildings and bridges. Clean steel will be the backbone for manufacturing in the future and workers like Neil from generations past to generations future will continue to be at the heart of the economy we're building for the middle class. See, economic policy is climate policy, is security policy. With growing competition, including from an increasingly assertive China, there's no doubt why it matters that we turn to each other now to build up a North American market on everything from semiconductors to solar panel batteries. Mr. President, with the Inflation Reduction Act, you're creating the jobs of today and tomorrow for the middle class in America. And this also means more clients for Canadian critical minerals processors, for our clean energy innovators, for our integrated auto workers, for our farmers, growers and producers, and so many others. It's an example of how we can make progress at home and as partners. Pour soutenir les bons to support good jobs in the economy of the future, Canada has one of the greenest electrical grids in the world. Some 83% of our electricity is already carbon neutral, and we are on target to achieve 100% clean energy by 2035. To do so, we are working with local communities, including projects led by Indigenous communities across the country, whether it be for solar panels or wind turbines. And all of our clean electricity exports go to the United States. Worldwide, we must all accelerate our transition to renewable energy. This week, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change published a new report showing that our planet will achieve a critical threshold in terms of climate change over the coming decade. That means more heat waves, more drought, more floods, and more endangered species. When I think of the families I met on the Atlantic coast last fall who saw their houses being torn to pieces by Hurricane Fiona, when I think of the people of Lytton, BC, whose town burned because of a wildfire during a record-breaking heat wave, I know that responsible leadership means doing more to fight climate change, more to protect families. Climate policy is economic policy, is security policy. En tant que dirigeant, As leaders, our people's security is our top priority. Not only do we have to keep up the good work, we have to do more and faster. And I know you agree. Mr. President, I remember our discussion in 2016 on climate change when you were here in Canada as Vice President. You met with the Premiers of the provinces and territories, as well as with Indigenous leaders. That same day, at the First Minister's meeting, our government adopted the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change, which essentially puts a nationwide price on pollution. I'm pleased to be your host again today, knowing that environmental protection remains one of your top priorities. Mr. President, what makes this such a moment of consequence is that our world, our way of living, is facing multiple threats at the same time. That's why 
security policy is climate policy is economic policy. Because climate change, inflation, war, energy shortages, but also foreign interference, misinformation and disinformation, and constant attacks on our values and institutions all compound. Democracies like ours, just like democracies around the world, didn't happen by accident and won't continue without effort. On doit être là, l'un pour l'autre. We have to stick together. We have to continue to face down authoritarian threats, both at home and abroad. We have to continue to defend what is right. This is not the time to compromise on our values. A moment to compromise on our values. This is a moment to double down on them. We must continue to show resilience, perseverance, and strength. Resilience, perseverance, and strength. These are words that perfectly describe two men who are here with us today, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor. Mr. President, when the plane transporting the two Michaels landed on Canadian soil after more than a thousand days of arbitrary detention in China, Canadians proved that resilience, perseverance, and strength are more than just lofty ideals. They're commitments that drive our actions and shape our character. Canada got the two Michaels home, and we did it the right way not just by respecting the rule of law, but by anchoring ourselves to it. When under great pressure to undermine our commitment to our agreements and treaties and to the rule of law, we did not capitulate. We did not abandon our values. We doubled down and we rallied our allies against arbitrary detention. And through that, with your support and your leadership, Mr. President, the rule of law prevailed, and the Michaels came home. Avec nos alliés et nos Together with our allies and partners, Canadians and Americans have to remain a source of inspiration to the rest of the world. But above all, we have to keep up the good work. Every day, we have to do what needs to be done to build a better future for people like Neil and Natalia, their kids and grandkids. And we will meet this moment. Mr. President, in your most recent powerful State of the Union, you encouraged the American people to stay optimistic, hopeful, and forward-looking. Well, this is a vision that Canadians share, too. So let's keep working hard, and together, let's continue to build a better future for our people.